Okay, wanted to get a live session going on this morning. Um, I was supposed to go to the gym, but upon finding out that there's a solar eclipse happening in the next couple of hours, I decided why not it would be better to just read and go live. I I tend to be a little bit superstitious in that way. I think a lot of it is because there is a lot of meaning that has come from the past, like a lot of past civilizations and groups. At least me researching online, I've looked at solar eclipses as a sort of bad omen. I don't want to say it's bad omen because I think a lot of it is your beliefs creates the reality that you want to to create. And I think a lot of it has to do with our like our inability to make sense for ourselves. And I think going back into the past allows us to see what previous groups of people have said, because it, it's, it almost frames it as us if it's a shadow um, that is being lit and the, the sun is, being, is hiding behind um, a, a celestial body. And a lot of it was like, stay home and reflect and stay. I kind of always kind of follow these, these spaces just to see how I can like navigate the world. So yeah, so I'm here and I want to read and explore the second chapter of Breaking Free from Mass Produced Consciousness. And we're gonna have a really great conversation. I hope you enjoyed the last first episodes. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Now let me check to see if this is actually going live. Okay, I'm a little short a little bit. <laughs> Let's see if I can be more of this. I'm just kind of checking the camera because if it's like only showing my, uh, let's see. Uh, I think it should be good now, right? Let's I want see. to read the next. Okay, what it, I just wanted to see how it looks on the camera because I'm, I have I have the YouTube pulled up here. Again, this is an experiment. I am starting these uh, live sessions in terms of like getting people to be engaged in some of the things that I'm working on. This is my chat. Okay, without further ado, I think I'm just going to start reading. Okay. So, uh, let's see. So we're gonna we're gonna see if we're gonna make it through the first chapter. So this first part is called self overcoming and self reliance. Um, a lot of the to give you context, a lot of this concept of self reliance specifically came from Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he talks about like it, this sort of. It was the first time in my life I had seen a healthy version of individualism. I think individualism as a concept or as an idea, especially in the West or in our American society, tends to be very toxic, I feel like. Um, there's a, a there's a toxicity, I feel, that separates ones from their community, separates ones from ourselves. And I think for very good reason, because it's like we want to be able to break free from structures, but I think inherently that toxic individualism is born out of the structures wanting us to separate from each other so they can have greater power and control in unseen ways. Um, so I think that's a lot of the energy behind this chapter is, is that how do we overcome ourselves to be more self-reliant? Um, and I think that's not an easy thing to do. So I'll start with, I start the chapter with a quote at the top. And this quote is by Albert Camus, Albert Camus. And it's a very incredible quote that resonates with me a lot and kind of encapsulate a lot of that dynamic that I'm talking about. He says, in the midst of hate, I found there was within me an invincible love. In the midst of tears, I found there was within me an invincible smile. In the midst of chaos, I found there was within me an invincible calm. I realized through it all that in the midst of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. And that makes me happy for it says that no matter how hard the world pushes against me, within me, there's something stronger, something better pushing right back. <laughs> I love this quote because it talks about this sort of 
there is a sort of foundation, as I spoke previously, that is inherent in creating and transforming ourselves. And we have to claim that foundation. So the number one person you will have to overcome is yourself. This is not a battle to fight the injustices that riddle the planet. This battle takes place inside of you. It's a war that the world and this intricately outdated design of our society have brought onto you, to your mind, to your heart, in your body. It's all chained up. All of that potential is locked away inside a dark prison made out of golden bars. You have to realize this on your own. Society doesn't force you to realize the magic you hold. It doesn't help you to understand the duality of a world we have come to embrace. This duality, this life of duality, comes at the consequences of your own abundance and our own personal evolution. It continually impedes on who we are. It impedes on our own needed complexity, our own dialectical existence, our own dance. It hinders our ability to remain in tune with the worldly orchestra it stops us from standing tall and singing with power and authenticity. We need this, yet the world has desperately failed us. I often pit the world against humanity and this traditional um, vision is because a lot of it, I feel like the world lives in structures and I think these structures seek to define a lot of us. But again, I'm saying that inner change creates outer change. And the whole canon of this first part that I'm reading is that the way the world has seemingly been designed in the imaginations of people who've come before us, a big a big proponent of it is in this reason, this rationality that is often defined by yes or no, or good and bad, black or white, big and small. It's not necessarily a, a pattern of shifting how we see the world it's more of like this is the way the world is and we take that as the answer and i think that's the problem i think that's it, that's part of the problem is is taking these things for the answers that they are for the answers that they cannot be and i think that type of thinking this sort of i call it a duality way of thinking it obviously has been defined so much because how do you structure or help build a civilization that has hundreds of thousands to millions or hundreds of millions of people? You need sort of rigid, simple ways of doing things so people can comprehend. At least that's how I see it. And I think there is a danger now that we've outlived that, that sort of duality because we are now living in a one world society. It's a society that's integrated. It's a society that has a lot of things around us, but we just not able to kind of conceive that global society because we're still in a nation state, we're still in parts. And, and, and oftentimes when that world society is, has been attempted, there's a universality that is crushing in a way that we need to think like everyone else, that we need to behave like everyone else. And I think this universality is born from this rigidness of dual dualism that is inherent in, in the modern life. So I feel like, as Camus was talking about, there is a force that you can utilize inside of you to push back, to claim yourself. Um, when the world has claimed for you how you're supposed to think and how you're supposed to live and breathe. Um, I, I'm going to continue. It says, the greatest battle one will ever have to come to face is the battle of selfhood. Who do you think you are? Why do you think you are this person? And why do you insist on reasoning with everything you have ever known from your own personal experiences and from your own schooling that has taught humanity the art of obedience? I'm gonna take a little bit of my coffee. This is like a Colombian coffee I brewed and left it on the fridge overnight. And it this the way that it's it steeps, the coffee steeps is like really, really nice and cold and fresh. It says critical thinking, creative thinking, and self-interrogation have been thrown out of you, tossed away. It's been pushed down, its flames are now dormant. 
say i use the idea of flames specifically because the flames are like are inherent and in the metaphor because things that are moving and unchanging and emergent i use that metaphor flames as something that can construct new things i can deconstruct and construct new things and oftentimes the rigidity of society the way that i symbolically see it as it plays in myself i see it as like a winter that has overstated its boundaries it's sort of like a season of coldness um that we cannot uh escape in a way so self-overcoming is about understanding that the world we seek is entirely inside of us we hold the answers to the greatest questions we alone can fulfill that deep desire to actualize ourselves in ways we've been deprived of. Our eyes have been blinded and our ears violently cut by distractions so loud that we cease to exist. We've been erased from existence. We've created a mass of apathy, zombies of mon mon mundanity, imprisoned in a crumbling castle of our own making. It's all. It's, it's almost as if it's like a, a, a side note. It's like the vessel of to which human consciousness has been created. How we understand ourselves, our emotions, our history, our gender, our people from across the world and their histories is tightly designed to be predictable. It's tightly designed to make sure that there is peace, that there is sort of free will. Uh, free will within the context. I don't think we have free will which is good. It's nothing that we're going to talk a lot about. But starting this chapter with um, the notions of self-reliance really captures why it's important to be able to claim ourselves um, and be that self-reliant force. So I'm going to read a little bit longer and then we're going to stop um, at the, the fight. Isn't it so beautiful? What better way to keep people at bay, distracted by lifeless storytelling and meaning systems that have, oh, they have become so tied to their identities? They're so profoundly rooted as they themselves become the carved out canals of psychological meaning, terrain, over which we engage our thoughts, our lives, and others. Isn't it so beautiful? The whole world comes in and it becomes us, leaving no extra space whatsoever, providing the need needed pathways to guide one human being towards their truest fulfillment. Isn't it beautiful how vicious and violent this mess is? It's genius, pure genius. Let's have humans believe something is theirs for the making. It's them, they're given identity, never to be questioned. How can we question something and change and transform something if the vocabulary and language to do so has been hidden from us for so long? To break this curse, we can and we must. We have to find the treasures that are deep below the vast oceans of ourselves. We must dive to find them, longing for the quest, however dangerous it may be, mining the wisdom from our own life and dealing with the pain that arises from it. It is of the utmost importance. Self-overcoming is about radically turning your attention to your mind, your thoughts, your body, and your feelings. Regarding these ecosystems, the world has blinded you to its degrees, its layers, its polarities, its rhythm, and its finer vibrations, hiding the fact that you and everything that you stand for can be reshaped, that you can burst from this continual chrysalis of humanity, that this self-overcoming, yet none of this is ever taught to you. Why would it be? If it were, our current society would cease to exist. Something new and better would emerge. I'll stand by that. I do feel that if more people know themselves, there's more self-awareness to the most profound levels, more emotional, psychic, cultural, historical awareness and how we position ourselves as humans. I think this creates a level of empathy. This creates a level of emotional maturity and complexity that allows us to handle more pain, more emergent, complex issues that transcend societal and, and nation states. And I think we, we're we not designing modern humans today to handle issues and complexities that are cross-national, that are cross-geographical, um, that, that span across time and space, across the world. We're designing humans to be subservient to a specific 
national and historical ethos. And for very good reasons, because we are kind of messy creatures and we do have a lot of self-destruction that we don't see can create more beauty. But we live in that self-destruction and control seems to be the the thing that we love. We love to be controlled and without knowing it. Um, Self-overcoming is going on a long journey to take on the wretched seas, the turbulent waters and the endless storm inside of you. So this is a call to action. This is a call to adventure that I'm making. And I'm saying that individually, one can, one can only be the only person that takes this journey. Like you have to will this and you have to give your intention out to be able to claim in yourself this power. Um, and I know that sounds cheesy, but I really do feel so. I think it's it's about sitting down and really contemplating why is this important to you? Um, and and finding why this is important to you. Because if it's not important to you and if it's not sort of sitting well in your stomach of why you want to find yourself more, why you want to claim more of yourself, why you want to be more self-reliant and understand your mind, understand your heart, understand your body, your emotions, understand all the parts of yourself. I think this curiosity about life and turning it inward, I think is something that will yield more goodness and greatness and, and, and unification towards the bigger human project on this planet. I, I will stand by that. I'll go back to, uh, so this is the th 13 pillar. It says, the human being is a fiery species, one of love, one of purpose, one that actualizes all of its parts into one. Like a star being born, like tectonic plates moving and islands rising to the surface of the internal ocean, so life can be born, so a newness from the beyond can arrive, moving seasons after seasons after seasons, shedding its skin, transformation after transformation. Yet how can we even begin to travel inside of us when society has frozen us, stunted our growth, clipped our wings? frozen the seas and numb mankind, depriving us of our eternal meaning. You're going to hear me say this a lot, but I believe meaning is magic. To have mastery of our own meaning is to have access to the full magic that we can be. Right now, we are faced with the greatest ice age, one that has truly ravaged our planet. An ice age of the mind, so vast that it reflects a distorted reality in our lives. And our society reflected on its crystallized surface and forces a disconnection based on lies in a world of difference. Difference here on the caveat is the difference from Derrida, who talks about difference in its analysis of words and how words and meaning and, and our ability to see truth to words is inherently hidden in how we understand language. And he talks about it in the sense that words or text doesn't lead us towards understanding a logic of truth words and text um inherently give reference to things that are not it um and we can we'll go deeper a little bit on that in the future too and if you have any questions and comments i want you to ask them because i i want to if something doesn't make sense uh please write it down in the comments A world where ideas we hold dear don't refer back to the deeper truth, but exist by the way of simple reference to others. Darker lies. Shadows on a wall eluding us forever, drawing us away from the present moment. How do we bring this ice age to a halt? Melting its waters that are bound to flood us. How do we build this ship and climb to safe harbor on mountain peaks to prevent ourselves from drowning? Then how do we lift this wicked winter that has overstayed its welcome in our lives and we've come to regard as normalcy, this comfort, this stationary way of living, the a chameleon in the skies? How then, how then, if this lie has been constructed within us for so long, how then do we welcome the natural flow of change? Bringing forth in us the natural seasons from the blooming of the spring to the heat force of summer to the clearing of the fall and the reflection of the winter. Um, this is like a big part of, of my theories. And I think the way that I've encapsulated like the human, the inner life of humanity, I see it as the seasons. And 
traditionally in the seasons there's four seasons and all the seasons serve a specific purpose um and i i liken the inner life whether it's equating it to specific months in our lives specific days specific moments specific years specific decades i think we go through endless cycles of these four different types of seasons whether it's the 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 fall when falls of leaves whether it's the hibernation and the, the winter and the the unmoving unchanging and things that can't grow during the winter whether it's the spring, which is the blooming of new parts, the flowering, the new leaves moving, and the bees and the and the colors, whether it's the summer, which the heat, the intensity of the heat, the the drought, the the speed, the fastness, um, and then you go back to the fall. I liken the inner life to these four seasons. At least I've seen this inside of me, and I think currently what this part of this first book is, is saying is claiming that we've overstayed the winter the winter does serve a specific purpose in being human it does serve a specific purpose in being human but the challenge is that overstayed winters leaves us frozen leaves us unable to learn leaves us more dogmatic leaves us in a depressive state and it seems that when creativity and love and complexity and these structures from society haven't necessarily allowed us to nourish ourselves, to know ourselves to the point where we can take ourselves and claim ourselves to be very active and very engaging of our inner life, to embrace the welcoming of these seasons. I, I, what I'm claiming is I'm claiming that there needs to be that foundational core that one that Albert Camus talks about. I think we have to be able to build that. But before we build that core, we need to understand what's happening inside. And because we can slip back into that, it is not something that's stationary in a way. So one of the ways that you can do to begin this journey is you have to create dangerously. You have to enforce your own self-destruction. It's the only way that one can fully expel the poison that has rendered the denizers, strangers in their own temple. An ice age that has violently laid forth a silent civil war in us, gluing us to black tar, decapitating our movement. You have to find the ways to create new meaning in the actual world. It's the only option. Self-overcoming is an active process. It's a notion in time. It's an action. It's a motion in time. It's an action. It's a conducive. It's the most conducive to creation, the language of the world. You cannot meditate your way into self overcoming. I'm going to repeat this again. <laughs> and I know this is going to be a counter contour, counterintuitive to a lot of what people believe this sort of spiritual journey or this new age vision of connectedness, this new era on the planet. I'm going to repeat this. You cannot meditate your way into self overcoming. Meditation is a, is a tool, but I don't think it's the most potent tool at this stage right now. What I'm saying is that self overcoming and self reliance, self overcoming to reach self reliance is an active process. And a, a key process to this is being able to be comfortable with creating things creating new meaning that you've never created before having experiences that you've never had before um and i kind of see this as like a i kind of see this as a a sort of it's almost it's a sort of, it's, it is it is a destruction it's like you have to create art you have to sing you have to do painting you have to take new classes you have to meet new people you have to travel you have to put yourself in an uncomfortable space you have to do things that are very different, that is gonna incite new light and meaning and, and, and words and ideas in you. Because if you keep doing the same thing every day and you expect this different results, I think that's called insanity. We are living in a very profoundly insane world that ex expects out of us to do the same thing every day and seeing different results. I think there is power to madness and to insanity but i and i think i think that comes in at a different stage but at this stage right now what we're talking about
claiming our inner lives so we can be more self-reliant and understanding who we are as people in our emotional states that has been so dimmed down. I think we have to face that destruction and that destruction happens to creation, to creativity. Um, I think that's a big part I want you to really think about. If you feel like you feel disconnected, you feel off, you feel that your life perhaps is not going to the direction that you want it to go, by by the act of creating, whether it's creating music with other people, whether it's painting, whether it's it's acting, whether it's not doing something passively like watching TV, whether it's even playing video games, I would say. A very That's also something we can impact later. But the idea that putting yourself as a creator and creating elicits cre- in, in a, a self-destruction that leads to more growth. Um, I'll continue. This is a, the, the pillar 19. Self-overcoming is about facing the dragon. This mythical beast is tall and large with wings casting fears all over your lands, bringing the only fires that are untrue. Fires that you have come to respect and the only ones you have come to wa- have come to warm you from the Arctic winds. Self overcoming is about moving inside of you to go to war and give yourself a fighting chance for your own dreams and the belief that you have been placed here for a higher purpose. And in this battle of the dragon, one must slay her with all of your might and bathe in her blood, thus absorbing her powers. This is no small feat. It is violent and is the only way. This absorption and new awareness gain are what we call self-reliance. This is a lot. I really want to read this passage again. Um, Self-overcoming is about facing the dragon. This mythical beast is tall and large with wings casting fears all over your lands, bringing the only fires that are untrue, fires that you have to come to respect, the only ones you have come to warm you from the Arctic winds. Self-overcoming is about moving inside of you to go to war and give yourself a fighting chance for your own dreams and the belief that you have been placed here for a higher purpose. It is a battle of the dragon. You must slay her with all your might and bathe in her blood, thus absorbing her powers. This is no small feat. It is violent and it is the only way. This absorption and new awareness gained are what we call self-reliance. Wow. I think this passage of number 13 is incredibly, incredibly important because it positions the journey and it positions a will against the individual, a will to be, a will to exist, a will to uh, express oneself. And then it's almost as if you have to go to war with yourself. You have to go to a loving war with oneself. Because who and everything that you are and how the ego has sort of created your perception, I think takes on so much of what we get to understand who we are as ourselves. Because in the earlier passage, I mentioned that... What did I mention? I mentioned that like because we are human we will not want to destroy our own world we will not want to destroy our own ego we will not want to destroy our lives because that's this is sort of evolutionary self-defense like we cannot just kind of destroy a meaning structure where we have no meaning anymore but what i'm saying is that we need to do that that's how you pierce the veil that is facing the dragon it's challenging everything that you know it is very much in a scientific way a little, a little bit. I've been getting more into the sciences. Um, I, it, it is tough. Like, it really is tough to see yourself and part aspects of yourself as the enemy. But the loving enemy. I think it, it, in this process of piercing through the veil of ourselves, inside of ourselves, and what we've known is a process that we have to do with care and we have to do with love. We can't do it in a very unemotional way. I think it's just about knowing that there is a higher purpose for us. And there is a sort of polishing of the higher purpose that you can get closer and closer and closer to higher polarities. And it it requires a self-discovery of the multitudes inside of us. Um, Self-reliance can only be reached by the teachings and self-awareness that has been gained from overcoming yourself time and time again. 
overcoming every part of yourself that needs to breathe in true alignment, that needs to be brought up to a state of resonance in being in tune with what you truly desire. This is saying like destruction, destroying yourself is not the only thing. It's destroying yourself to create alignment, to create patterns and pathways of yourselves that you didn't know before. Self overcoming is the return to the original self, to your aboriginal self, your creative center. Self overcoming entails creating the unique keys to your lock. You can rely on yourself if your foundations your core and your center this have all been based on how can you rely on yourself if your foundations your core and your centeredness have been based on lies it's at best rocky and doesn't profoundly honor you your spirit and what you can become i think this is saying that we're born into a world that is inherently plagued with symbols and simulacra and simulation and we absorb that in our meaning structures and our operating structures. And when we're saying this is inherently not true and it's based on lies, then one can almost claim that parts of ourselves are untrue and also based on lies. And But how do we reach this? Like, how do we reach it? How do we reach it fundamentally so we can start to see more? So I'm gonna I'm gonna read a little bit through this. We have almost we have a little bit more, um, a little p little. We have a little bit more left. I'm gonna read the. I'm gonna go through the whole thing, and then I'm gonna s sit back and have a conversation. How can you rely on yourself if the ingredients and in cookbook the world has provided you are meant to create only one thing, a recipe for harvesting and extracting your soul, for building your own prison. For enabling your own incapacity away from liberation, away from love, away from all the things you ever dreamt as a child. One cannot begin to be self-reliant if they haven't begun to overcome themselves. Bit by bit, you are the hero in your own journey. You have to decipher your own cuneiforms, your own language, unique to you, unique to your spirit, unique to your creative center, unique to how you think and how you feel. You have to venture out into the foreign and arid lands inside of you despite the pain, despite the loss of self and everything you have known to be. So I'm claiming here for duplicity of selves. And that's, it, that is critical in my theories here. Self-reliance is slowly understanding in a very radical way who you are, the finer points, the different parts and components that make you you, your ancient language, encoded before the world began. This horrid invasion has taken place. You are meant for greatness, an orchestra for producing sounds to inspire and move people to live more freely by anchoring what means most to you. Self-reliance is the hero, going one by one, liberating this large musical ensemble, all spread out and hidden in the farthest corners of your world. It is resuscitating force needed to bring back the mammoth frozen in the ice. It is turning the melting waters into wine. It is turning the lead into gold. So I'm referring a little bit to alchem alchemical sort of language of like Western alchemical uh, esoteric traditions about turning lead into gold. It is it's about claiming and remembering parts of ourselves that existed long before we were born. Those are soul parts. Those are ancient parts. Those are parts that came in before society kind of flooded and defined what that inner space could look like. One by one, you, the hero, must gather and understand each member of this orchestra, your orchestra, bringing them back to a single village, sitting around the bonfire of your soul, sit, sitting with them, hearing them out, letting them tell their own stories, their whys, without judging them living them out through action, then embracing the challenge of helping them find their unique magical tools that allows them to express themselves fully so they can play within their place in the ensemble of the whole of you. All of them are you. Each member will hold a unique tool, whether that be a violin, a cello, a double bass, a flute, an oboe, a clarinet, a trumpet, a trombone, a tuba, and anything that is unthinkable. Anything in the unthinkable imagination. Know that time and action are needed 
to master these tools and devices. And this is the, the active part that I'm talking about that's very different from meditation. Um, is that we have a duplicity of cells, of identities inside of us. And through creative processes, we can figure out who they are, why they exist, and claim them in ourselves and bring them towards a center point where they can be in conversation with each other. And I think that's the foundation of that emotional, psychic, cultural, historical awareness that I'm talking about, the imaginative space inside of us. So we can claim in ourselves that foundation to exist, to be creators of this new world that is being born in our time today. Self-reliance occurs until you learn to read the musical language unique to each part of your ensemble. Self-reliance to the highest degrees is learning to make music with what you have and whom you have liberated and brought forth within yourself. It's a call to be born. It's a primal scream to exist. Many feet dancing and moving in the scent of yourself, bringing new forms into existence. Rejoicing and welcoming yourself to yourself. It is the building of a new village within your soul, one that can withstand the dark storms of life, the towering clouds that will unleash the torrents of sadness, dimming your eternal spark. Self-reliance is building back your own inner society, reclaiming yourself and learning from yourself, your own civilization that has been violently kept away from you for so long. Only then shall self-reliance win out. So you can start to see, I am using this sort of old moniker as above, so below, so below, so within. Um, and this old moniker says that systems of, of and the higher reflect systems in the old lower. And how our systems reflect in society today reflects in, in our systems internally, that we do have an inner community and an inner village inside of us. I think that has been the greatest way of sort of understanding personalities. I think Sigmund Ford talks about this, this inner societies. There's a lot of different thinkers and philosophers and people that have spoken about this inner society. And I feel it's critical that we start to map out and see ourselves in, in duplicities and that we're not just one thing. I think to understand that oneness, we have to reach to the points of complexities in us. There will come a time when all the cores have gathered together. There will come a place when these parts have all arrived and your center has been made. There will come a time when you will have created a safe passage and safe entry for the endless refugees and messengers inside of you. Those forces, will you will hear the musical sound and arrive to reside in that unbreakable and unshakable center. There will come a time when you have at last built a dam and tools to harness yourself. All the flows that move into you will vitalize new life and new wealth like the Nile River. There will come a place where all who lived inside of you will be at home, placing their roles, playing their roles, moving a democratic center, Fear not, for there will come a time when you will sing your song, all of its beats, all of its motion, and everything you desire will synchronize. There will come a time and place where the central bonfire of your soul, which once was but a tiny spark that built exponentially, licking at the very sky. All of you will watch as this eternal sun centers all of the things as the truest conductor that you will surrender to. It will shine in all your lands and all your shapes, your patterns, and your heroes who have stepped fully into their roles, bringing forth your potential, putting forth in motion the natural seasons of your inner world, a realm that has been long been frozen. Hold that little spark and let it guide you through this eternal darkness that the world has made the norm of this world inside of you. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. The self-overcoming and self-reliance is your destiny. It awaits you if you are simply willing to take it. This is the first chapter titled Self-Overcoming and Self-Reliance. Now, I just wanted to reflect a little bit together what this all means um, for us, for you. Um, because there's a lot of claims that I'm making 
in this chapter it's 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 a very it's a lot of radical claims that are very different it's a very different way of thinking i've always been this a person that's been interested in the inner life and spirituality and philosophy and i think this book came because i felt like there's a lot of people that are sort of trapped by their emotions and maybe they go about doing things and not really knowing why they do things they just kind of do things because of the motion and they think that's the way that things are supposed to go uh, because that's how their upbringing or that's maybe how they were sort of rebellious at certain points and they define their identity but what i'm claiming here i'm claiming that to be human is to be in constant motion of renaissance and to be in a renaissance is to claim parts of ourselves that we don't know even exists yet is to bring them to the surface and this process of duplicity and this this multitude that we are we contain multitude as um what was that uh this american right this american poet i forget what his name is american american poet poet he says what wilman uh what walt whitman <laughs> says i contain multitudes and i think it's so true i think all humans contain a lot of multitudes and it's it's imperative that we claim those multitudes and the challenge is that a lot of this work will not make sense f from the people around you and it might not make sense to you right now because you might not even have the language to understand something that is coming from a higher world or higher force so i think the sentiment in this little book is really how do i like break free how do i break free i love the idea about the dragon i think it's so true i think we have i want to personalize this pain or this suffering or the madness of our current times as a dragon and we're so cold inside that the flames of the dragons and that pain and the madness and the shadow the flames that it creates are the only flames in that inner life. And what happens is that we become so attached to the flames that is burning us <laughs> because it's warm and because it's so cold that the coldness is so cold that the fires of the dragon is the only familiar thing that is the closest thing to the soul, that is closest thing to the, comple the emergent, creative, complex core that I'm kind of aiming at that we should be going at and, and making rise um yeah i i feel like the this process of self-reliance to really claim ourselves in a very healthy individualistic way that is not toxic that is not what modern life has sort of created like right now in us is is necessary um yeah i i wonder if you have any thoughts or questions um i'm happy to communicate with like through those that like that process in a way let me know what you think because there's a lot to this i i think during the pandemic when i first um begin writing this book i really wanted to to write a book to remind myself that like i am not the box that society puts in i'm more than the box i'm more than the container it's like we're a spiritual being having a emotional human experience yet our way back to that spirit there's so many different barriers and layers it's like imagine if like there's like a library that has like a thousand levels um society only gives us maybe one or two levels and we don't even know that 90, 997 levels even exist and even going through those different levels it requires like deep self-destruction and requires deep creativity and deep trust of self into the unknown because and these two levels is where a lot of the pain enters um, and then the pain goes in and seeps in into these unknown spaces and we don't really know how to react and how to how to be.
I think for me, the big ideas from this chapter is that I feel that you should pay attention to is that, yes, the number one person you will have to overcome is yourself. Um, everything that we seek is entirely inside of us. We're not going to find it in the external world. It's inside. And that's a different way of thinking. Um, there is an ecosystem inside. And I think we need to start building a language or meaning or, or imagination. You have to use your imagination to imagine what that world inside of you could look like. Um, yes, we are zombies of mundanity. M-U-N-D-A-N-I-T-Y. But I would also say we're zombies of modernity as well. <laughs> and I'm not claiming modernity is a bad thing. I recognize that we're, we're living in the best times ever. There's less war. There's less pain. There's less people in poverty. There's less this. But I do feel like there is in, in an increasing vision. There is also a disease of the soul. A disease that is separating us from our communities and from ourselves. And I think that's what we need to start to engage before it's too late. And another big idea is there is an ice age inside of us. Um, I feel like a lot of this is just like, it's such it's so dense and packed together that it could even be a bigger book into itself, which I am currently working on. Uh, and I hope to tell a little bit more about this. Yeah, I, I feel like I always see the the idea, the other metaphor I really like is the idea of the orchestra and that we have different parts of ourselves that are very much um, or like it's like every time you claim yourself, every time you find that self, those cells, the, each of these selves have unto uh, themselves an emotional sort of intelligent way of being and and i really feel that the more you discover yourself and you're able to kind of engage those cells and kind of reach that highest form of self-actualization that's when the now the biggest challenge is like once you find that those different types of yourself it's now figuring out where do they fit in you where does that energy live where is it in that part of that inner community? Is it in the back of the house where there's a river? Uh, is it in the dungeon? Is it in the town square? Is it in the kitchen area where people eat? Where are these, what are the roles of these people when they are by themselves? And where are the roles of these forces in you when they are together? Um, again, it's a lot of metaphor, it's a lot of imagination, but it's also, using that as a tool to map out who we are and to create space inside of us because i think it's through that space that so much can arise um i think that this process is is a humbling process and it's a process that might not make a lot of sense um but i but thank you for coming for this reading and seeing this if you have any questions let me know but this is this is this is the work this is literally this is the work is to find that inner and claim that inner outside of what the world has done and i think there is i think the the, the challenge is synchronizing that inner once we've find found it it's like as we're discovering ourselves we 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 need to find synchronization because it can create more disarray. It can create more pain, more darkness if we let it. But it's like if we have a handle on those parts of ourselves that we discover and we synchronize them. And as we welcome new things, that system of synchronization needs to adapt, needs to grow because you're welcoming a new variable. It's like you're at a different stage of your life and you didn't even know that you needed to be this person for yourself. You didn't need, you didn't realize that you need to be a manager or you needed to travel. You needed to find a more kind version of yourself. All of these kind of untangle the patterns that we've created inside. And, and the, the challenge is that can we create patterns that are emergent? And can we tap into those patterns inside of us that gives us more life and more ability to deal with 
the madness of our current world. A world where there's war happening right now in the Middle East. A, a world where there there is the hottest year ever, apparently, according to scientists, in the last hundred thousand years. A world where loneliness is has risen to the highest levels it's ever is risen. A world where polarization is happening between political groups and, and different groups that claim righteousness. I think we are living in a world of deep, deep, deep revolution, as I introduced in the first session. And I think to live in a world of deep revolution and not succumb to a madness that dims our light requires of us to dive inside, to claim and map those parts of ourselves that have remained hidden. And then once we're able to start mapping it, we need to build a structure that allows them to engage and dance together in synchronizing force. And I think that's what I'm alluding at is that the inner work is, is a work of destruction and creation. It's a work of beauty. It's a work of, of understanding that the complexities that we can harbor inside of us is what's gonna match and reorder the complexities of our current times. Because we have a lot of leaders and a lot of people that claim to be leaders, I would say, or still operating from a consciousness of the past. I think for me, the consciousness of the future is a consciousness of unified world. It's a unified earth. It's a earth that we live today where a lot of the issues where we could look at the global pandemic, for example, those are transnational issues. They require transnational, transcultural, transcorporate, trans experiences that that transcend national sovereignty. It's a global vision and a global consciousness, a collective consciousness that is required for us to deal with this emerging crises of our time. But yet, we're operating from the Enlightenment era, the nation state model, which has brought a lot of innovation. But I think for me as a sci-fi writer, I, I believe very deeply that connecting with oneself and finding those fragmented parts, creating that inner sovereignty, this inner democracy in a very tactical way, in a very psychological, philosophical, imaginative way, which is what this book is all about. One can start to have the foundation to tap into that consciousness of this globalized world. I know a lot of people in the past, when you think about world governments, they kind of feel it very negative. It's very dystopia. It's very, it's done really badly. But like the United Nations is not a world government. The United Nations has no legal sovereignty over other countries. Um, it's there to advise countries. And I think if we need to start to imagine what a global world order can look like in a healthy way that is powered by people who see themselves rooted in their types of cultures and histories and futurism and stories and narratives and connected to a bigger energetic force, I think... I, for me, I see that's the biggest problem is tapping into that collective consciousness. But we we're not going to be able to tap into that collective consciousness if we don't claim it into ourselves. If we don't find those, those extreme polarities that we can both be lover of, of, of this, of the goodness of life, but we can also be haters of an idea or a framework. And that those two identities and beliefs can live inside of us. That the space of the inner world can anchor paradoxes. I think it's, if I were to narrow it down a little bit, I would say it's all about like holding paradoxes inside of us. Is, and it's like, it's almost as if it's an anti-dogmatic vision of what it means to be human. Um, it really is. Anti-dogmatic. It's like, how do we live without dogma? How do we live with belief systems that have outlived their potential? But it, just because we live with these belief systems that have outlived their potential, I think a lot of it 
requires us to find those sprouts. It, it founds, it begets us to find ways to integrate ourselves. I think this is the challenge of today. Is it's like it. It, it, it is it is not there's no like easy way to do this because how does this translate economically how this translates politically socially environmentally it's yet to be determined like in the ted talk that i gave like one of the key things that stood out to me is the idea that is the first thing i said i think is that we're living in a world where younger generations gen z's and also millennials are in school and they're learning about jobs and works and frameworks of the economy and an economy and jobs that don't even exist yet how is that possible like 70 to 80 percent of the jobs of the future in 30 years and 20 years are not even existent or non-existent like there's a massive level of disruptions in terms of our values, in terms of how we see the world, in terms of how we sort of comprehend the nature of reality. Like people go back to the 90s, we're in a completely different way of living, it seems like. We have the internet, we have the news media that is more intensely in our lives. We have greater polarization. We have constant change, yet we're holding on to the 1800s as a way of living and in this extreme decentralization of like truth through social media is also coming in there to sustain a world that we've known it's almost as if it's like change is coming but the only thing that we're gonna do to embrace this change is connect with the thing that has given us meaning that has given us comfort that has given us sort of ideas on how to to live I want to fix this camera a little bit. Yeah, it's it's troubling. And I think that's why I wanted to start first with this nonfiction book is to talk about this process of self-discovery and self-reliance, self-overcoming ourselves, because oftentimes we are our own problems. Yes, there's oppression in the planet. Yes, there is madness in the planet. But I think oftentimes what is fundamental to this oppression is is there sort of a, it's an acceptance of that oppression um because it that oppression i think is very much psychological and i'm not saying that the oppressive natures of the world and the forces of the world is inherently let's say like a process we have no control over the process that the, that the idea of of justice of an oppressor against an oppressor is not something that we should talk about but i do feel like as humans we have incredible power and i think these cycles of violence and these cycles of realities on us in this changing world want like want transform into better things until we break free from the mass produced ways of thinking that or the world is created. I think that's literally what I wanted to come to talk about. And I feel like we have to remember that this is a process of love and this is a process of purpose. And that the process of love and purpose is something that is born out of the flames of creativity. And that is just a thing that can warm in us, the process of change, like truly can, can help us. So yeah, if you have any thoughts and ideas, please leave them in the comments. This is the first part of Breaking Free from Mass Produced Consciousness. And thank you again for tuning in. And until next time, we'll be back.